All right, well, welcome to Questioning Christianity, the channel that's really devoted to helping you connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. My guest for today's episode is really well known in the online God conversation world, Justin Briley. Uh, For many years, Justin hosted an incredibly popular debate and discussion show between Christians and non-Christians called Unbelievable. And he went on to pen a book by the same title, Unbelievable, Why After 10 Years of Talking with Atheists, I'm Still a Christian. But more recently, Justin has launched out on his own to to pen a new book, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. And he's also been hosting a podcast documentary series with the same title. We'll put links down in the show notes for you to follow it, where he's really chronicling the rise and fall of new atheism, how it's had its heyday, and many of the flickers of the afterglow are still felt today, but how the God conversation really has moved on. And many of the most popular secular thinkers out there today are rethinking their abandonment of religion in the past and taking the God question seriously. So Justin, all the way from the UK, I'm very glad to welcome you back onto our channel. Oh, thank you for having me on, Dan. It's, it's a delight to be back with you. Yeah, appreciate the time zone differences too. It's always great talking to people who live in the past, but uh, you know, <laughs> the UK, you guys are brilliant at being able to bring all the cultural flair and pomp and hold on to ceremony. So one of the values that we love about you guys. Well, um, congrats well on we the feel like we've got, your... we've got a long-term connection with you guys, you know, so, so you know, the feeling is mutual. Hence, we need to put in the cheeky one-liners wherever we can to try and claw our way back into the world of the credible. <laughs> but, uh, you know, us convicts, we, we just try and stay alive out here on the dangerous shores of Australia. Um, your, your new book, congrats on getting this out. That's a big deal, being able to pen a book in a busy home. I saw in the thanks right at the end of the book that um, just give this beautiful appreciation towards your wife who uh, brought coffee and made all of that possible. It's wonderful <laughs> to see, but would love to hear more about what inspired the book for you and uh, really how it's been received as you've been talking to audiences around the world and maybe even received by some of the people that you chronicle in the book itself Mm. well the book really started back in 2020 when i was thinking about writing another book you know following the first one that i published and i had in my mind an idea for kind of writing a book about conversion stories and maybe drawing out sort of some apologetic principles from it Um, but it was in the course of talking about it with some publishers that one of the things I mentioned sort of in the sort of the idea for this book that that really came to the fore which was this this the way I'd noticed the conversation changing really um, between Christians and non-Christians in the time that I'd been hosting the unbelievable show and um, and that really kind of was the catalyst for kind of really writing a book that was more about the the way that the conversation around God has changed over the last several years Um, because I had noticed you know, having started my unbelievable discussion show back in the heady days of new atheism and those full on dogmatic debates between well-known atheists like Dawkins and Hitchens and Harris, opposite Christian apologists, I'd noticed that the, the tone had changed quite a bit um, to where I was seeing more and more non-believers coming on who were distinguishing themselves from the new atheism, saying I'm I'm not a Richard Dawkins kind of atheist. And equally were were kind of open to the value at least of Christianity, even if they didn't believe it themselves. So so that was really interesting and and really um the the catalyst for the kind of image of the book, which is a sort of tide coming in, was that well known poem by um Matthew Arnold, the Victorian poet, Dover Beach, and he talks about this melancholy, long withdrawing roar of the sea of faith in his generation, you know, 150 years ago. And I thought, well, that's only gone out even further, obviously, with the secularization of Europe and the West. But um, it was a conversation with Douglas Murray, who's a sort of uh, a thinker, sort of conservative sort of pundit here in the UK. And I had him in conversation with N.T. Wright, and he mentioned this well-known poem about the melancholy, long withdrawing roar of the Sea of Faith. And he said, the thing about the Sea of Faith, Justin, is it may come back in again. You know, the sea doesn't only withdraw. And he said that is the point of tides. And Mm. he was mentioning that in the context of himself seeing some surprising converts to Christianity among his peer group. And he himself is not a Christian. He's sort of lost his faith in his sort of early 20s, uh, very much became good friends with the new atheists, you know, regularly went to lunch with Christopher Hitchens. But but himself came to realise that atheism itself wasn't enough for people and wasn't enough for him he he actually calls himself a christian atheist now because he recognizes that all of his values and virtues really come from christianity not from atheism 
So that was just an interesting example and, and kind of got me thinking, well, you know, maybe there's something going on here. Maybe what Douglas has noticed, what I'm seeing in terms of these secular thinkers who are taking Christianity more seriously, what I've noticed in terms of the new atheism coming, but then kind of going for all kinds of reasons that I think feel there's a story to be told here. And that's really what the book is. Um, and, and also, obviously, this podcast documentary series that now accompanies it. That's that's where it's all come from. Mm. And how's it been received, particularly by maybe some of the people that you mentioned in the book, like the Douglas Murrays and others? Yeah, very well, as far as I can see. Um, you know, one of the people I do focus on in the book is is Tom Holland, um, who's uh, the historian, not the Spider-Man actor. And he's a really <laughs> good example of one of these secular thinkers looking again at the value of Christianity, um, because from a historical perspective, he's really been talking a lot about the way that really all of our moral instincts in the West are still essentially a product of the Christian revolution. And I've kept up a, a, a friendship and a dialogue with him over the last few years, and he kindly wrote an endorsement for the book. So I, I think he must think it's OK. Now, the question is whether I'm not saying that everyone agrees overall with my thesis, mm. you know, um, is it really are we really looking at a sort of a rebirth of belief in God? Though I think a lot of people certainly agree with aspects of it, you know, that the new atheism has come and gone, I think is fairly indisputable. And even a lot of new atheists, I think, are kind of regretting to some extent some of what their movement actually produced in the end so so i think i think it's been well received um i've had a lot of a lot, a lot of lovely comments a lot of good reception to it um the podcast as well i've been overwhelmed actually by the amount of goodwill and enthusiasm there's been um because the podcast is quite different to what i've done before it's a much more sort of produced documentary style mm -hmm. telling a story a narrative woven in with music and and interviews and everything else and i think people really like the the way it kind of takes them on a bit of a journey and i think you know go, it takes you back to an era that you know may seem like quite a long time ago for some people but i think it's it's kind of reminded them just how much things have changed in that time so so it's been really fun yeah really really gratifying to have that mm -hmm. kind of encouragement Oh, that's awesome. And I'm keen to maybe tease out your thesis a little bit more for people that might be coming fresh to this, maybe don't have as much of the back history and following the comings and goings of the new atheism movement. Um, what would you say is kind of the central idea that these secular thinkers are cottoning onto? Why have they shifted from the antagonism of Dawkins and Dennett and Harris and Hitchens in the mid to late 2000s then to, hey, maybe there's something more to religion. What do you put that down to? I think a variety of things. Partly, partly it's just that I think some of them came to realise that the new atheism itself was a sort of quasi-religious thing. It, people were just substituting one form of sort of belief and ritual for another, you know, the worship of science instead of God, um, the kind of a materialist creed and orthodoxy for a, a Christian one, arguably. Um, and also just recognising that ultimately it didn't actually provide answers to, to life's deepest questions, you know, the question of why we're here and so on. Um, the answers it did provide, you know, science and reason, they're good for some things, but but they're not a toolkit for living a flourishing life. So I think there's just a lot of, you know, even like secular psychologists who just recognise people need more than, than that, more than atheism alone can offer, more than secular humanism alone can offer. And I, and I think that's the second part of this is that there's been an, an acknowledgement that what atheism failed to do or even in some ways contributed towards was this meaning crisis that we're experiencing in the West where people are living these lives where, where they don't feel like they, they have meaning, they have purpose, they have an identity, and they're looking for it in all kinds of areas, but areas that don't seem to be satisfying that search. And and in the book, I, I say that I think this is because we've lost the unifying story that once people did share, kind of almost at a subconscious level, which was the Christian story mm. for millennia. And as that's kind of gone away, people have been looking for something to replace it with. Um, but I think a lot of the things that they're replacing it with are kind of quasi-religious in nature they're, they they don't do the, the the job if you like um so I th so i think that's part of the reason why some of these secular thinkers are kind of looking again at christianity they're suddenly realizing kind of what we're missing in the absence of it as i say um some of them like tom holland pointing out the fact that actually a lot of our fundamental assumptions are still essentially formed by mm. the christian story it's just we've forgotten <laughs> that it, because yeah. as he says you know it's the water we swim in you know we barely recognize the fact that our belief in something like human rights is essentially a theological belief um mm. so so there's all of that going on um and and i think you know I, and i think because there's sort of this search for meaning and i think it's only been accelerated by technology social media you know, we're seeing a kind of an epidemic of anxiety, depression, suicide among young men, sadly. I think all of that's kind of 
forcing people to to kind of take a second look if you like at the christian story because it feels like the atheist secular kind of utopia of science and reason and a wonderful future just hasn't materialized in our culture mm. clearly so i think mm. it's led people to think well maybe there's some some wisdom here in these ancient stories mm. um that doesn't mean they're all you know jumping in to them as kind of really believing them and it doesn't mean that the churches are suddenly packed to the rafters with you know converts but i do feel like there's a kind of new openness to god to christianity that simply wasn't there if you go back 10 or 15 years it, it feels like the conversations people are having around that today really have changed in that way well there's a ton of things i want to dive into in response to that um but this idea that the new atheism has really waned do you think that the major figureheads of the new atheism added anything lasting to the atheist war chests of arguments against God? Or do you think they have any enduring legacy that you still notice today? I mean, I, I wouldn't say they added, added any new arguments per se, because I think, you know, the the atheists who had gone before them had, had spelled out really the arguments against God, probably more convincingly in, in some ways, intellectually at least. I think what they had was a lot of rhetoric. Um, they had, you know, media personalities. They had obviously the flair to kind of bring it across to a popular yeah. audience. And I think that was the big difference with the new atheism. You know, they had the closest thing to a, an advertising campaign, really. Um, back here in the UK, they had this atheist bus campaign in 2009 with red buses bearing the slogan, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. So this was a kind of, it was just the, the way that it was being put across was very different to anything before in that sense. Mm. Um, and I think there were a variety of reasons why we had this sudden upsurge in this quite sort of full on public form of atheism. Um, I don't, I mean, personally, I, 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 I don't sort of regret the fact that it happened because it was a, a, an amazing talking point. You know, I, I was delighted when there were buses circulating London telling people there's probably no God, because frankly, most people wouldn't have even thought about it in the UK, mm. you know? So I was glad people were just being reminded there was an interesting question here, you know? Yeah. Um, I know, prompted I certainly far gave more. talks at church yeah. based on that, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So I, th I just think like, that it was actually a gift in many ways, the new atheism to Christians. Um, having said that, you know, obviously, I'm sure the new atheists did reap a certain number of deconverts, but I, I do feel like they were just sort of, it was just the end, product of a, a long process already of secularization so i i don't really feel like the new atheism itself was some sort of huge kind of um threat to the church it was just i think a symptom mm. more of 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 where culture was going and the fact that it did actually kind of collapse back in on itself so quickly is is a marker of i think that it was a a bit of a specific moment in time um and I th and and to that extent, whether whether hist how history will remember the the you know the, the architects of the new atheism, hard to say. I, I think there there'll definitely be a, a certain part in the in the Wikipedia entries that kind of talk about this particular phase. Though even all those people, they're on a journey too. You know, um, we're obviously going to talk about Ayan Hirsi Ali, who has had mm. quite a dramatic shift in her thinking, and yeah. even someone like Dawkins, you know, who's obviously still an atheist. He's not talking about things in the same way he used to, though. He's not kind of, um, you know, he, he isn't um, hard, kind of dismissing Christianity in exactly the way he used to, because I think he's realised for him there are enemies closer to home in academia among mm. his secular peers. And yeah. so he's kind of like changed his his enemy basically his enemy are no longer really christians it's it's kind of the people he sees as these you know woke secular peers that he he feels are now preaching another kind of quasi religion in his own backyard mm. so so i think in a sense the history books will see new atheism as one particular point in the in a process but where you know the culture was changing very quickly anyway I'm curious to, to get your take on Dawkins. So recently he did an interview with Alex O'Connor, who some of the listeners on here might be more familiar with his old handle at Cosmic Skeptic. Um, just wonderful internet YouTuber, uh, young atheist, who I've always found to be eminently reasonable and thoughtful in how he engages with Christians. But uh, Alex interviews Richard Dawkins, and it really does seem this generational shift in different kinds of atheism. And I was curious to, to get your reaction to that video purely because there are some times in there where Dawkins does seem to jump back into the normal mm. rhetorical blast mm. of Christianity as being immoral because of things like 
uh, the way that the atonement deals with sin and you vicarious mm. atonement mm. and all these sorts of things. Mm. Mm. But it was interesting to watch Alex, who shares the same ultimate conclusion as Dawkins, push back with some mm. of these things and mm. say, yeah, but couldn't you just make sense of that in this way and yeah. try yeah. and find a more positive understanding or a, a better way to frame that that isn't a straw man or isn't simply trying to set up something you can easily smash down, but is quite sympathetic to maybe some of the themes mm. and why mm. that might be seen as good news in our culture. What do you make of the contrast between the yeah. two of them uh, in an interview like that I, I had exactly the same kinds of response and feeling about it when i watched it and i, I know alex fairly well having, having you know had him on my own yeah. shows over the years and, and done several interviews and hung out with him a bit and um and i would say you know he he's a good example of kind of he had his teenage atheist phase literally it was a teenage atheist phase because you know he started his youtube channel when he was a teenager and, and I think he kind of modeled himself after the new atheist to some extent. But I think mm. he he just grew up, basically. Uh, and I don't think, he, you know, disagree with that. Um, he had more experiences. He met more Christians. He went and actually did a theology degree at Oxford University, lived uh, alongside Christians. And he hasn't become a Christian, but he just realizes that there's more to this than the new atheist kind of rhetoric. Mm. And what was interesting is he's still friendly with, you know, people like Dawkins. Um, but yeah, when you watch that interview and it does just strike you that he's asking basically all the questions I would want to ask Dawkins. He is actually kind of putting the other side to him. And and in that sense, uh, you know, I, I think Alex is kind of a long time ago graduated from the kind of the new atheist school of, of thinking. And he does he genuinely kind of is interested in working things out and not just arriving mm -hmm. at a specific uh, answer there is no god um so I, I i applaud him for that um i mean yeah dawkins kind of certainly because they kind of trod some old territory kind of went back to some of those christian um sort of arg arguments against christianity but again i i don't hear him talking about that very often if i'm honest mm -hmm. um because i just i just think he's come to understand it's that's not <laughs> i don't think he genuinely feels like the, the Christian view of the atonement is kind of dangerous for our culture right now. Um, I think generally speaking, he's, he actually feels like he often has a lot more in common with a lot of Christians mm. than he does with many of his own sort of secular peers, as I say, because it's, that's where he's been campaigning. That's where he's been talking. You know, mm. he, he's, he's worried that the objectivity that he, you know, is so keen on in science is being threatened by certain types of ideology and culture. And so, so it's interesting to see how much he's he's sort of toned or the whole thing has changed. I mean, another interview I watched him in Peter Bogosian not so long ago, where Peter Bogosian basically said to him, do you think we made a mistake, you know, with the new atheism? Because we've effectively cleared the floor for all kinds of other quasi-religious views to come in. And I mean... I, I might be misquoting him here, but Dawkins said something to the effect of, well, maybe it is better the devil you know. You know, maybe we're better off with people being mistaken, but being Christian, than people being mistaken, but these new kind of quasi-religious forms of zealotry mm. that now seem to dominate social media. So so I think he's kind of almost hankering for the, for the good old days when he just had to kind of take on Christians rather than having to take on people in his own academic backyard uh, increasingly. Yeah, the Christians in his generations turn, certainly probably turned the other cheek more so than the kind of uh, people that yes. he's sparring with these days on Twitter or X. Um, but uh, that was sort of the first chapter in your book, first of seven, on the rise mm. and fall of new atheism. And then you move on to the second chapter to talk about sort of the new God conversation. And, and then you chronicle a whole host of these sort of secular public intellectuals, uh, people that are in academia or who are in cultural commentary and journalism. Um, and, and some of those figures uh, have certain qualities that are pretty similar, like pretty similar social strata or a pretty similar global experience. Um, you've got Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson and the big Jordan Peterson effect sort of jumping out of 2017 and um, his meteoric rise, but, but a huge shift in the way that he's obviously had big religious themes that have mm. appealed to large numbers of secular people and particularly secular young people. Um, you mentioned Douglas Murray already, Peter Boghossian, sort of the father of street epistemology, but a philosopher who, again, is taking on very different challenges in the academic sphere now than the old, what he considered sort of the attack on Christianity. And so it's is, is sort of shifting his approach. Um, you've got uh, the YouTuber Dave Rubin from the Rubin Report, just all of these different figures, Tom Holland, who you mentioned, um, who are sort of chronicling this shift in becoming a lot more favorable, at least in their understanding of how Christianity has contributed 
good towards the West and maybe many of the values that animate us in uh, in our culture today. Um, but a couple of questions that maybe uh, I'd love to throw mm. your way in light of just that demographic of stories that you tell. And I love how the book tells stories, but in, in light of that group of people, is this trend, the surprising rebirth of belief in God, just anecdotal? I mean, how representative is this so-called turning of the tide when it comes to the God conversation? At this point, yes, it is anecdotal because I'm not, I haven't done any thorough research, you know, I haven't sort of done a, a, a big survey or anything like that. Um, in a sense, you know, it, it's a fairly small field you're choosing from, though, when it comes to mm. academic voices, public thinkers, you know, there, there are only so many of them um, who are, you know, have a certain amount of influence. Um, and what I can say, I think, I think even at an anecdotal level, it seems fairly obvious to me that the influence of the very anti-God sort of type of rhetoric that was there among various public thinkers just just doesn't appear to be there anymore. That that doesn't seem mm. to be where the conversation is. You, they're not kind of getting op heads. They're not. That's not the kind of the thing. Um, whereas I see a lot more, you know, of of these other voices who are kind of making far more sympathetic noises towards Christianity mm. coming through. So, I mean, I haven't done a, a sort of, you know, scientific or, or academically rigorous survey of that but I, I feel like that would be borne out if you were just looking mm. at that sort of top tier of 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 who's saying what it's not that every public thinker is suddenly you know going on about god and saying how great christianity is but for those who are saying things i feel like i've definitely seen a, a change in in the atmosphere there i mean that doesn't mean that you know there's some massive swing towards <laughs> towards christianity or anything like that um certainly you know, just at a public level, obviously all the statistics we have are continue to go in the direction of decreasing church attendance in the West, increasing sort of, you know, non-religiousness and that kind of thing. I think what I'm describing is really just, if it is anything, it's a, it's a, it's a changing in the atmosphere, a kind of the very mm. beginning of a turning of the tide. And time will tell whether that results in, you know, something like more people eventually ending up in church converted to christianity and so on again i've got plenty of anecdotal stories of people who are being influenced by these thinkers so you know mm. to take jordan peterson for as one example i think you know you watch his stuff you know especially his kind of lectures and the stuff he does on his youtube channel he's he's extremely you know uh, positive about christianity now it's done in his kind of psychological way and you can kind of debate where exactly he falls when it comes to christian faith but I, all i do know is i know lots of people for whom he has opened the door to a taking mm. christianity more seriously and some people have walked through the door to christian faith so so again i'd be fascinated for someone to kind of who has the the time and resource to do a study on this um to stop it being quite so anecdotal because it'd be fascinating to know mm. whether there is a swing you know just in terms of attitudes as much as anything towards Christianity. Um, but yeah, but that's not what the book is, I'm afraid. So so I, I'll hold my hands up to that and say, I, I don't know for sure. I'm kind of going more on the, the, the kind of temperature that I've taken from where I'm sitting, you know. Yeah, and, and time will tell. I guess, you know, we'll get, get to have this conversation again in a few years and sort of see where the tides are developing, so to speak, and whether a tidal wave of new Christian converts have kind of been drawn in by all the, the role of the, that these voices have played. Um, there's kind of another concern maybe based off some of these observations that the turning of the tide or the thing that in our culture that's opened up these uh, intellectual elites and culture makers to consider Christianity isn't really Christianity per se, that it's more the usefulness of the Christian story and maybe of Christianity in serving as a cultural bulwark against things that are worse, or um, that it's a tool for offering some kind of band-aid over the meaning crisis uh, where these figures are co-opting the Christian story rather mm. than actually being drawn towards Jesus and the things that he cares about, about personal repentance and about the healing of the sick and caring for the poor and um, these real vertical concerns between a person getting right with God and then the horizontal elements of what it means to love our neighbor. Uh, what's your response to whether or not this is just people using Christianity as a useful um, sort of tool to their own ends or whether this is a real yeah. interest maybe in what Jesus has to offer? Yeah, I, and absolutely, I, I kind of talk about that in the book and especially in, in this new podcast, because I think that that is a real concern. Um, and I I personally am not interested in a Christianity that is just being used as a 
some kind of foil for some kind of Christian nationalism or purely political, you know, service and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and I think there's probably, if I'm honest, there's going to be people at various different points on that spectrum. Um, I think there are some people who do, gen you know, really see religion as serving a kind of useful functional serve point, you know. So some of the, you know, psychologists that I talk about in the book, Jonathan Haidt, um, John Viveki, I would say that they're, they're fairly committed to a kind of basically naturalistic view of, of the world, mm. but they but they kind of just say, yeah, but religion is really useful for those who embrace it and adopt it. Um, it's great. It, it kind of, it's got all these psychological benefits. So they're, they're kind of, I'd say, in, in fairly in the kind of useful fiction kind of brigade. Um, mm. And it's not that there's no value to that because that in a sense, they're, they're, they're giving more credence to religion and to Christianity than the new atheist did, who said religion's terrible for you. You know, it's absolutely, you know, so so you can that might be the beginning of a conversation, even if they, yeah. they don't particularly see it as, as ending up in certainly them embracing Christianity. Um, then I think there's people sort of somewhere in the middle who are kind of genuinely drawn to Christian faith. They, they feel kind of conflicted um, in some way and they would really like it to be true. Um, I might put Douglas Murray in that that camp who describes himself as a sort of conflicted mm. agnostic who I think has in at some level a real heart pull towards it. He also sees obviously the the value, you know, he's a conservative when it comes to, you know, his politics and culture and I so I think he's naturally drawn towards it as as seeing this is something that conserves kind of values and so on that the west that that it kind of brought about in the west. So I think there's a bit of both going on with that. Um, then you've got someone like Ian Hersey Alley who says, well, look, I'm embracing this. Now, what does that mean exactly? Maybe we, we can talk about that. But she certainly seems to have gone a bit further on and say, I don't just think it's useful socially and culturally. I think you kind of have to embrace this at some level to make sense of it. Um, mm -hmm. And and then you've got kind of people who I think have leaped all the way in. And I tell the story of a number of you know converts uh, in the book who 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 have just found that the Christian story makes sense of their story and the story of the world. And yes, who, who may well believe that it's also good for culture, but they're not embracing it because it's good for culture. I think they're embracing it because mm. they really think it's true, that it's the true story of reality. Mm. So I think there's going to be people all along that spectrum. And I think some people are moving as well in in some way um, as they kind of get closer and closer. I mean, one, one example of that might be um, Louise Perry, who um, I think maybe her parents are Australian. So I think she might kind of have some some uh, link back to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. But um, Louise Perry now lives in the UK and, you know, has been this interesting person who's written a book really as a secular kind of um, person looking at the socio-evolutionary kind of aspects of sexuality relationships. And really in the process of writing it came to very Christian conclusions. So she wrote, she titled the book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And essentially comes out saying, look, just purely on socio-evolutionary grounds, monogamous marriage is a really good idea. Um, but I think in the process of that, she's come to realise that Christianity is also quite attractive. But I think she finds herself again in this kind of like, I'd really like to believe this, but I'm having trouble kind of surrendering to the kind of metaphysical claims of Christianity. So that I think there's people who are kind of on a journey who first of all recognize the usefulness and then start to kind of edge their way towards maybe mm. it really being true you know and that's kind of a, a, just a change in the shift of how christian faith has been shared i think for a long time in that there's been a very individual invitation to have a personal relationship with god that's based on a recognition that god exists and that jesus what we claim to be and that all of us need god's help because we fall short of who we should be we need his forgiveness through the cross and that's sort of been the doorway that christians are really familiar with people kind of coming along and doing an alpha course but all of a sudden to have people noticing wow the world's changing and mm. the cultural inheritance seems to be fading from Christianity mm. and that's creating some concerns and people are asking, wow, is there a better way for us mm. to be animated as human beings to understand who we are and why we're here? Is there a story that makes sense of this? And, and so it is a different beginning point, this sort of cultural yeah. concern. Um, mm. Do you, do you yeah, see it, that drawing people all the way to actually then hearing the, what would be considered the gospel, the good news or the personal relationship yeah, I, with I, Jesus? As I say, I don't think there are any guarantees and, and, as I say, I, I think what what I'm not interested in is a kind of a, 
a West is best kind of apologetic for Christianity because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, the kingdom is not of this world. And whether it's this or something else, what I'm interested yeah. in is, is that Jesus is the centre of reality. I think some people are starting to realise that as much as they, they love and value the the kind of ideals and institutions of the West that they maybe want to preserve and hang on to, I think they're increasingly seeing in the wake of, you know, lots of tumultuous world events that kingdoms come and go. And the, and I think it does inevitably for some people to ask the bigger question, OK, well, well what is there anything that stands above all this, you know, that that, mm. that, that we can kind of have as a secure foundation? And and I, so I do see people edging towards that kind of that bigger thing, which is whether or not my Western ideals and values and so on are here in 100 years time. What's actually mm. important about life? Do I think this thing called human rights, equality, dignity that were obviously, you know, baked in at some level to the Western sort of project? Are they true? Um, or and and I think the more that people kind of are confronted with other options, you know, to, to put it mildly, China, Putin's Russia, you know, other worldviews that are absolutely on the table and could be the direction that the world goes in. Um, mm. I think they're increasingly led to, to wonder, well, what, what, am, what am I actually basing this in? What, what is there something more than just a really useful way of ordering your society that I happen to like because I was born into it? Or is there something sort of really true about this idea about human equality and dignity? And um, and so I, I feel that is kind of forcing a good number of people to kind of take seriously that, that question about whether Jesus is who he said he was and the fact that, yes, absolutely, the Christian revolution kind of gave us these ideals and institutions and virtues, whether or not they survive. The bigger question is, are the things they founded on true? And, and I think you are seeing more and more people kind of being pushed in the direction of that question. Yeah, and it's interesting watching even sort of Jordan Peterson's move from the just use of the Bible as almost a psychological foil uh, or to tell these big foundational stories that help us make sense of our own development through to then coming to tears when someone asks him mm. about Jesus and if this is real and this is serious. And so he's obviously on a, mm. on a journey mm. as well from that similar kind of direction yeah. of its usefulness for human psychology through to, wow, if this is true, this has personal implications as well. Um, I really appreciated, I think, those couple of chapters right at the beginning about uh, the rise and fall of new atheism and sort of the afterglow and then also then wrestling with, all right, well, where is this conversation kind of moving? You made a comment relatively early in the book about how the church kind of got caught off guard with new atheism's explosion onto the scene and that they raised a whole host of objections that Christians just weren't really ready or equipped to be able to respond to. And certainly the scene's different now, huge uh, sort of academic response from philosophers and apologists. But um, you also mentioned, though, the concern is now that the conversation's moved on, that the church may be caught off guard again by not knowing what kinds of questions to respond to and getting caught in an old kind of conversation rather than a new one. Uh, what do you think Christians should be thinking about? What kind of questions should they be ready to give an answer to? Yeah, so I think sometimes the mistake is to continue to answer the questions people were asking. And they're important questions, and it's not that there isn't anyone asking them. But I, I do feel like the conversation around new atheism, which was far more about kind of show me evidence for God, has is religion good for us um you know uh, can we sort of you know can't we just get make sense of life through through science alone and that kind of thing um those those are important questions um but i don't feel like that's where a lot of people are starting now basically the kind of mm -hmm. does god exist question um i think a lot of people are starting from a how do i make sense of life right now question sort of give me a reason for getting out of bed in the morning kind of question mm -hmm. And that's where I think you're seeing people like Jordan Peterson suddenly, you know, drawing all of these millennials and um, Gen Z because I think it's substantially the same kind of audience that were turning up for for Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and so on. Um, but now they're I think they've kind of gone beyond sort of that sort of phase where it was just a kind of very anti-God, anti-religion thing and they're they're kind of they're kind of looking for more they're looking for a sense of how do I make sense of life I, th I think it's you know I, I think that there's a real search especially among young men because I think this is to some extent a kind of identity crisis 
that's come yeah. upon young men in the West, where they're, you know, where a lot of the kind of the kind of typical markers of masculinity, etc., are being questioned in the West, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of I don't know different messaging on social media that you'll encounter, and you've got some people kind of looking for an answer in the likes of Andrew Tate, you know, that kind of uber masculine sort of quite misogynistic way of of encountering the world and relationships. Um, and you've got some who are kind of being drawn to Jordan Peterson, you know, who kind of is this more sort of fatherly figure kind of talking about responsibility and and that kind of thing. Um, and you and I, 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 and I, I guess all I'm saying is that's that's kind of the kind of questions people are asking, if you like, it's more mm. about who am I? What am I supposed to be in the world that where I'm quite confused about what it means to to be a man or a woman, um, to be human. Um, and and I think the church, you know, it, we'd still need to answer the people who are asking, does God exist? Give me some evidence for God. Give me a, you know, a reason to believe in the resurrection. But I think you have to start actually where people are. And, and I think for, for many people, it's it's kind of, it's these questions of, of who am I actually in mm. this world? Um, and that's probably why, you know, some of these folk are becoming so popular. Um, and, and I think that's probably where the church should be focusing its efforts as well in that way. Mm. Well, one of your chapters in that regard is called the rediscovery of the Bible, um, which again, touches on many of the figures that we've just talked about. And what do you mean by this sort of rediscovery of the Bible? What is it the, uh, sort of commentators are drawing out of there that might be surprising to many young people today as they're asking these sorts of questions? Yeah, well, again, it's 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 a kind of good example here with Peterson, you know, filling auditoriums, you know, back in 2017 when he was still a sort of cult figure. You know, he was drawing huge numbers, uh, again, of young men often to kind of, to kind of two or three hour lectures on the book of Genesis. Now, that, again, seems like a, a strange thing, you know, because you only have to go back a decade before that. And, you know, Ricky Gervais was filling an auditorium with a kind of stand up set kind of ridiculing the Bible. And, and that was sort of the normal way in which the Bible was being talked about. So I feel mm. like something changed, you know, in, the, in those 10 to 15 years. Um, and I and I think what has changed is, again, it's, it's this sense of people realizing that atheism doesn't ultimately answer their questions. It, it kind of it can tear something down quite easily. It can dare down God. But what does it erect in God's place? And I think, you know, Peterson and others have been kind of pointing people back towards the Bible as this kind of interesting sort of psychological well of wisdom, you know, that's sort of come down to us over the centuries. Again, other people, as like I mentioned, Jonathan Haidt and others are are talking about scripture in, in, in these sorts of terms. Now, as I say, I, I'm not saying that's all there is to scripture because I think obviously it's more than just psychologically useful but I'm kind of interested and pleased that actually it's getting a public airing people are kind of recognizing mm. that there's this deep sense of pattern and meaning and you know just stuff that's helped people and help people to kind of find that meaning purpose and identity over many millennia um, and just generally I, I just see more of a kind of an openness to the value of, of the bible again through the type you know pe through people like Tom Holland and another kind of you know people who are just kind of pointing out you know now that the new atheist kind of rhetoric has sort of slightly gone away that actually it turns out yeah this this bible has completely shaped um all of our literature and art um you know shakespeare milton dante all stand downstream of the bible essentially um you, you know and even dawkins was happy to to sort of contribute towards a campaign to put a copy of the king james version into every school in england not because he believes the Bible is true, but because he at least, you know, grudgingly is happy to recognize that it's immense sort of, you know, in, in its translations, it, it's immense sort of cultural value. So mm. I think that, that the Bible, in a sense, has never gone away. It continues to be the bestseller. And and I think rather like a phoenix from the flames, it tends to always uh, outlive predictions of its death, you know, by its critics. And I think it, we're seeing that again at the moment. But you could add to that the fact that I think there's also been a revolution in historical studies when it comes to actually not just showing that the Bible has this immense depth of psychological usefulness, but that actually we can really believe the stories it tells us about Jesus and about who he was and his, you know, life, death and resurrection. So for me, it's it's a kind of um, I love that people are kind of taking it seriously again as a psychological source of wisdom. But I think there's an even 
more amazing story to, to tell, which is that it's not only useful, but it's, it's actually true as well. Mm. And it may be the one, two step in that regard. If people are first exposed to it in this, maybe there's more to it. Maybe it's good for me just to consider what wisdom's there. And then wait a second, these stories sound credible in how they mm. relay the story of Jesus. And so it may end up just being the doorway through which people enter that next step of taking the, the Bible, not just as useful wisdom, but as something. Yeah. And, and I, I see like Jordan, Jordan Peterson, you know, you mentioned him sort of breaking down in tears, talking about the person of Jesus. I almost feel like he's, he's kind of touched on that at various points in some of his conversations where... Mm. He's kind of recognized that this person seems to bring together the world of the the sort of the mythic and imagination and psychological, which he's so invested in, with the real world, if you like, of history and facts and material reality. That that if there's any candidate for someone who in whom, as you know, Lewis put it, myth became fact, it's Jesus Christ. So I I'm quite excited yeah. when I see some of those thinkers seeming to go on a, a similarish journey to Lewis in that way, starting to see that 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 there's a real difference to this person, Jesus Christ, and and mm -hmm. the fact that he represents in history in a person all of that kind of meaning and myth that people often you know do find is the most you know the thing that actually makes sense of life, if you like. Mm. And it's it's kind of interesting then considering what Christianity is in people's minds too, because for some it's a set of ideas and maybe useful ideas that help create a particular cultural move. For others, it's a set of practices or spiritual habits that uh, allow them to have a sort of relationship with God or community with other people. And then there's for others, it's a set of experiences, you know, these sorts of spiritual encounters with the divine, these supernatural sorts of moments. And it's kind of interesting watching the interplay with some of these key figures as well. So in the story, you actually mentioned um, Dean Mays, who I was on your uh, Conversations podcast, the unbelievable show, a couple of years back to have a conversation. Uh, he's an ICU nurse. A lot of my own history uh, with sort of the God question was born out of asking questions around suffering, experiences that happened in my own family. And it was fascinating. You, you quote him from that episode, actually, where he said, uh, when it comes to Christianity, intellectually, I'm, I'm kind of there. Uh, I guess there's just an experiential ingredient that's still missing. And I think a lot of people may be cottoning on to, there might be more to religion or the God stuff than what I realized before. Maybe I've never even heard of the arguments for God's existence or the reliability of the resurrection or any of that stuff. But but intellectually, I'm, I'm kind of more open to Christianity than I was before. But what is this ex experiential element? Because you've got mm. someone like Jordan Peterson, who, as he's going along, is still intellectually not there when it comes to things like the resurrection in history and Jesus really rising from the dead, a central kind of Christian belief, a doctrine, teaching, historical fact, this sort of thing. Um, but he is having spiritual experiences that are moving him profoundly mm. in his inner mm. being. And then you've got other people like Alex, who we mentioned before, who describes himself as a non-resistant non-believer, an earnest seeker who has done a theology degree, who has lived with Christians and done Bible study and has wrestled with the arguments for God's existence. And not once has he had any kind of experience that has persuaded him that God's real, giving him a sense that, hey, there's more to this than just um, people making arguments around this big idea. Um, I'm, I'm curious for you, as you're hearing these stories and, and watching certain people have certain experiences and other people not, experiences that they want to have but aren't having, like the Douglas Murrays, why do you think God seems so elusive? It's a really difficult question because, as you say, there are some people where, I don't know, the intellectual and experiential aspects all just seem to come together and they can embrace mm. it and it, you know, and others where one part or the other just seems to be missing and and they never then you know they seem to have, have trouble getting there it's, and it, on the face of it it, do, it doesn't appear to be as you say because of a sort of um you know antagonism or or reluctance um so you can only take people on face value as to what they say you know um that, that their motivations are kind of as they see them uh, i think to some extent we're all you know uh, our deepest motivations are hidden to all of us in a sense we're 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 very complex aren't we and, and who knows what's going on at a deeper level um I, I guess i can only say that that there may be some people for whom it's just a really long journey that there's a lot of stuff that has to be sorted out that that before and it may be a very slow process of kind of integrating the possibility of of a kind of you know one of better words supernatural realm into their kind of very disenchanted sort of 
materialist kind of brain, which 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 really struggles with that. Um, and I think um, and for other people, you know, they seem to be make, make the, the switch much far more far more easily. Um, mm. I mean, you know, with Alex, I guess, I'd you know, if I was having a conversation with about it, I'd, I want to know well, what sort of experience are you thinking would make you feel <laughs> that that you'd kind of had the, you know, some sort of conviction that God actually exists. Um, because I would say, you know, even Alex, when I've had him in, in conversation with one or two people has has talked about the way actually his he think the dial has moved for him. You know, he's not uh, he's no longer as convinced as he was that God does not exist. I think he he feels somewhat more agnostic now on the question of God. Mm. And he sees that there are some arguments that are actually not bad, if you like, that he can see why some people would be convinced by some kinds of arguments. So even that is, there's a sense in which even someone like Alex, who obviously is not a Christian, and doesn't believe in God, has nevertheless, you know, been given some kind of uh, evidence that that it might be true. And, um, but obviously it's, it's not enough for him. And so it, it's going to, that's going to vary massively for each individual person. It's going to be a, a whole range of factors in terms of their personal psychology, where they put the the bar, you know, uh, of evidence, what counts for them as a kind of religious experience or sense of God or whatever it might be. Um, and we're, most of us just aren't in a position to know what, what that will be for any individual. All I can say is that I think, I think, um, you know, I guess as a Christian, I do honestly believe that when Jesus says, ask and you'll receive knock and the door will be opened that he means it and that actually for for anyone who really wants to ask jesus in there is going to be a way in which that can happen for them it's not going to be the same for everyone so one person's experience whatever it might may or may not be for dean you know to kind of for him to cross the line might be very different to alex o'connor might be very different to people who have you know um so I, I just it's it's really hard to say what that is um but i'm 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 kind of um yeah i guess i guess for me it's it's going to be about potentially some of those folk maybe moderating their expectations of what it means to um to believe in god because mm. there's so much more going on than just a kind of intellectual assent to something and there's a lot more going on than a kind of an, a fuzzy feeling that you could put down to just, you know, what you ate last night, or whatever. Um, a lot of the time it's um, almost, you know, taking a punt and acting as though God exists, I think. Mm. Sort of saying, well, I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to try praying <laughs> to see what happens, see if anything comes back. I'm going to read the Gospels and see if anything happens. I'm going to try going to church and and see what happens and in my experience it's it it like you know a personal kind of intellectual journey you know in your own head is one thing but but kind of putting yourself in a place where god could speak to you in a variety of different ways is is a slightly mm. different thing and that's um inevitably that's that's going to be down to each individual as to, to what they feel comfortable doing you know um Mm. So, and I, I, I don't want to stand here though disparaging anyone, saying you haven't really looked, you haven't really searched. I, I'm just not in a position to know what, what, what the individual state of anyone's search or soul or heart or posture towards God is. Um, I'm just happy to kind of leave leave that ultimately between between them and God, and mm. do whatever I can, hopefully, to to offer some words of wisdom or help along the way. Totally. I think it's really useful advice. I think even from the divine side, I mean, God's knowledge of what happens if he intervenes now in a person's life and reveals himself first in two years or five years, God just knows more than we do around when and how to intervene in a way that's going to lead towards his ultimate end game. Um, and bring that about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do I, have a question. I couldn't agree more. Somebody... I, I mean, I sometimes wonder whether, you know, and I'm not, I'm not claiming this is the reason why X has not actually claimed Christian faith but but what's interesting to me in some of these instances of these these kind of prophets from outside the church who don't seem to have stepped inside yet but is that they're they're actually they're more effective interestingly in pointing people towards Christianity mm. by not being Christians ironically because people are actually far more open to listening to them if if they were already kind of sold up a lot of them they, their message wouldn't be landing now I'm not mm. saying that's like 
complete explanation for, for why they haven't necessarily crossed the threshold to faith. Mm. But it is it is just one example of, it's of one of the, the way in which totally. you know things yeah. things things pan out, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting question to to ponder. Why didn't Jesus intervene and give Saul the Damascus Road experience? well before he did why wasn't it before stephen was stoned why wasn't it when he was first mm. getting jealous to start persecuting mm. the christians mm. why wait in that regard and and you do think there's just a whole host of reasons that god could have that we're just unaware of as yeah. to why mm. he intervenes and when um i've got this uh sort of repeating thing in my head so across the book you bring up the meaning crisis i think in nearly every chapter in various ways um because it's so pervasive you know we're, we've almost run out of the in, the inheritance. I, I often use the analogy of um, you know our society now, our culture in the West being a prodigal culture in the sense that, like in the story of the prodigal son that Jesus tells, it takes the riches from the house in which it grew up, and then goes to try and find adventure on secular shores, but ultimately ends up that inheritance whittles away, and sort of this moment of wake up. It's like, wait a second, mm. what am I doing mm. here? How did we get here? I love um, that, and I do know. I'm going to I'm going to have to nick that one, Dan. That's such a good that's such a good way of using that story to for our current culture. <laughs> um, I love it. Uh, it. Well, it just makes a, like a, the parallels become obvious in that regard. And I think the question mark is, you know, you've obviously got some then of these big secular thinkers who are waking up to that degree and saying, "Hey, wait a second. There's something here that we can't sustain. Cut off from the roots that we were connected to. What do we do about that?" But that wake up moment happens for different people at different points. And some of those wake ups don't necessarily lead back to Christianity. You've got all kinds of bizarre social movements back to the trad wives and uber masculine uh, figures that we've sort of described before, just these odd social media phenomenon. But they're, um, for the average person on the street who might be listening and going, okay, meaning crisis. Yep. I don't have an enduring why for my existence. I do feel like things are reasonably fragile. What does the Christian story actually offer in the vacuum of those answers? You know, when the Sam Harris's and Dawkins used to say that the why questions are silly questions. Um, how does the Christian story answer that, that why question? What is it that you think that it really does offer people who are experiencing this meaning crisis? Well, I, I think it offers a way of understanding your value as not dependent essentially on anything within this world um, or on how well you do basically it's it's basically the well-known concept of grace in christianity that's that's at the heart of christian faith mm. um because i think people are searching for for meaning purpose and identity but the markers of of that that are so often offered to them in our culture are basically how how well you you know project a certain identity um how true you are to a certain cause how well you kind of represent yourself um, in the public yeah. space, and yeah. um, and I think you know, as as one as Alan Noble, who's a, I think a really interesting Christian writer, has put it. He he talks about the kind of intolerable burden, really, of basically inventing yourself from scratch that exists for many people in our culture today, and I think it is a really really difficult burden for people. And it's, as I say, why we're seeing this meaning crisis, I think, and this, this rates of anxiety and depression, especially among younger people. And I think the Christian story simply sort of takes that burden away and says it's not about it's not about you <laughs> in the end. It's not about how much you can manufacture your own value and uh, importance and um, significance and identity because it's all been given to you. Um, freely and yeah. that's a really that can be a really hard lesson to learn though it's such a counter-cultural message in our culture but essentially i would say the christian story just is the story of a god who made you in his image that gives you infinitesimal worth whether you're a successful youtuber or you know cleaning toilets down your council estate you are made in the image of god that gives you absolutely infinite worth and value not only that he showed that by coming and living in your skin as it were in the person of jesus and experiencing all the things that you experience and again this is the second bit which is that you know the problem is in our culture if if essentially it's down to you then if you make a hash of your life then you know you made a hash of your life and and, and there's not much to be done um 
but Jesus came and he said, I'm with you in the struggle. Um, and that means that however difficult life is and however much we mess it up, there's a kind of a hope that actually there's that, that God has come alongside and is with us in that struggle. Um, and again, that's all about grace. That's all about sort of it's it's not ultimately down to us. Um, and that alone, I think, has given countless generations and millions of people just the ability to get through because they know that, that the God of the whole universe came and, you know, experienced the same kind of trouble and suffering that they did. Um, so knowing you're knowing you're made in the image of God, knowing you're not alone, and knowing that 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 God's there with you in in this thing called life, and then just this hope that actually, whatever your you know your contribution was, however good, bad, or indifferent it appears to have been in the eyes of the world, that God has also given you a sign that there is this new world to come. Um, and that you're invited into it through Jesus's death and resurrection, you're somehow invited into something that is far, far bigger than your small part in story. But you're invited to be part of that story and that your contribution is not meaningless because you were intended to be part of this story. Um, that is really different to the secular material story of reality, which is that you're essentially just a cog in a deterministic machine you have no agency your part in this was always predetermined prescripted and um you you were you know it was always going to be the way it was and and really you have no control over that there's and and i think so many people are living with a sense that they really don't have any agency or control um in their life because they've been told that basically you're part of a you're a cosmic fluke in a otherwise meaningless universe that was always going to be the way it was and the end of the story is the heat death of the universe in which all of your dreams longings and aspirations will be lost in a cold sterile void now that's one story of reality but it's not a story that actually works with the way people actually encounter life and so so i just find the story in which actually all of those none of those hopes dreams and longings will will be lost will will they'll all be meaning mean something because god is this God who can redeem everything. And um, and in the end, you know, I mean, I think there are lots of things you can do as a Christian apologist to show why this could really be true, you know, that there is this person, Jesus, and he really did die and he really did resurrect. But in the end, the, the first thing that I think is going to make someone interested in that story is that they want it to be true. They want that to be the way life is because... Um, and, and so for me, that's 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 the exciting thing that that this is a story you want to be true, and it turns out a story that, that is true as well. And um, so for me, that's that's where I would point people to that this is the best story that's ever been told about reality, and not just because it's a lovely pie in the sky idea, but because it makes sense of us, it makes sense of the world, and makes sense of history. And and I think more and more people are kind of turning back to it, thinking maybe maybe there is something in this, you know. Mm. Well, Justin, that's such a helpful parting message, I think, to anyone who's been listening to this and uh, and wants to just think, okay, what would Christianity mean for me? How does it really answer that meaning crisis? Just those different elements that the Christian story offers. I think it's a really helpful window, and maybe we can sort of wrap things up right there. Um, if people want to get a copy of your book or to discover the podcast, The Surprising Belief, uh, I'm sorry, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, uh, where's your website? Where can they go? justinbriarly.com is the website you can find links there Great. to my newsletter if you want to keep up to date with my projects you can get um free chapter of the book as well when you sign up to the newsletter um but you can also buy the book there's signed copies of the book available through the website as well and of course links to the podcast too which uh, if you uh, enjoyed anything you've heard on today's show you'll kind of hear in much more detail in the documentary series so justinbriarly.com Mm, well, the documentary series has been phenomenally popular here in Australia. A ton of people have said that they're really appreciating just different 
pastors and Christians who jumped on even commented uh, on the post I was doing about have a recording with you today. So just big thank you for that. And also just uh, I want to share with anyone who's uh, considering maybe picking up your book. It's just really beautifully written. Uh, you've honed that skill, mate, of talking to people over many years and incorporating their stories. And I thought that mixture of reasoned argument and storytelling of people's own experiences and framing the whole arc, uh, seven chapters, all of them contributing something really useful to the overall thesis. So really, really worth picking up if people haven't done it yet to oh, go and uh, have a read for themselves. Yeah. Well, Justin, thanks for joining us today on the show. It's been great. Oh, thank you, Dan. It's been a delight to be with you. God bless. Thanks, mate. Well, congratulations on making it this far. As we always say, these are longer form conversations and we really do hope they're helpful in bringing the Christian story to life for you and helping answer many of the doubts and questions that you have. We'll make sure to put all the links from Justin's work in the show notes so you can click just below to find them, along with where you can like, subscribe and comment to help boost this in all of the algorithms and then find us over in social media accounts at QC Socials. If you don't yet follow us at our channel, uh, questioningchristianity.com, you can subscribe there as well to get updates from us or to submit your own questions for us to make new content. But until next time, truth invites questioning and we'll see you later.